Good morning and good afternoon to the audience. Welcome to this webinar on mycotoxin screening and automation. My name is Julia Roser. I am the product manager for mycotoxin screening test kits for Eurofins Technologies. And it is my great pleasure to host this webinar jointly with my colleagues, Evelina Parisi and Francesca Bravin. So today we are having a short introduction from Evelina about mycotoxins risk assessment, and she will provide a light overview on technologies available for industries to monitor and handle the mycotoxins risk. Then as industries on laboratories also as well, need to verify and validate a method prior having it in routine, I will provide a comparison of our validation protocols and approaches. And finally, I will hand it over to Francesca, that is our automation expert, that will debrief what has been here, her approach to apply and validate ELISA test kits for mycotoxins to one automatic plate analyzer. And she will explain what counts to be measured, what, what has sense to be tested. So before we start, I would like to remind you that you're all muted, but the chat box is open. So feel free to drop your comments and questions during the presentation. We will read as many as we can at the end of the webinar. So let us start with Evelina introduction. Evelina, uh, the floor is yours. So thank you, Julia, for the introduction and many thanks to the audience that has connected to our webinar today. So let's start. As you all know, mycotoxins are toxins compounds that are naturally produced by certain types of molds. Hundreds of toxin compounds have been identified so far and continue to be characterized by research groups all around the world. As mycotoxins producing fungi can grow on a wide variety of foodstuff, such as cereals, dried fruits, nuts, and spices, they represent a matter of concern for both animal and human health. Livestock and pets can suffer both of acute poisoning from highly contaminated feed and long-term effects on their health, including cancer induction, immune deficiency, and sexual disorders. Also, animals could revert native toxins into metabolites that can accumulate in animal origin foods. And this is the case for aflatoxins B, converted into aflatoxins M and extracted in milk. It is therefore clear that through both vegetal based foods and milk products, adults, children, and infants could be exposed to a variety of toxin compounds. Among all mycotoxins, the highest focus by an analytical point of view is related to the compounds listed in these slides. Aflatoxin B, G, and HEM, deosinevalenol, fumonicins, zeralenol, T2 toxins, and okra toxin. Their toxins are also those with several regulations, for at least recommendations, related to the maximum concentration permitted in food, food ingredients, and feed materials, with the regulation amended by the Food and Drug Administration, the European Union, and locally by several countries like China, Japan, and India. Well, not all mycotoxins are equally probable to contaminate one single product. Here, we report very briefly the preferred growing conditions for mycotoxins producing mesites and risk assessment related to each kind of material. Indeed, hot summers are the ideal conditions for Aspergillus to grow, both with high humidity and under dry conditions. Drought is indeed weakening the plants and compromising their capacity to defend and isolate the fungus. Mild conditions are acceptable to almost all kinds of molds, meaning that mycotoxins co-occurrence is very frequent and very risky by the health point of view, because there are still unknown aspects related to synergies and additive effects 
of mycotoxins compressants in one single food or animal feed. Knowing that mycotoxins are toxin and we will all have to quarantine any contaminated material, who is actually performing mycotoxins analysis? Official control bodies, customs, local public institutes are in charge to verify the compliance of products to regulations, defending both animal and public health, working under research scopes and survey purposes also. Just to mention, in Europe, a lot of efforts and attention has been put in the last decade to emerging toxins, modified mycotoxins, and also to the mycotoxins pattern change related to the climate change. Data collected are reported to international entities that revise the exposure risk assessment and could recommend also some novel prescriptions and a legislation update. The food and feed production chain actors, including producers, millers, food industries, retailers, exporters, need to manage the risk assessment related to mycotoxin contamination to be at least compliant to local law. More often, contractors must comply with specific limits provided by their own customers. For the feeding industry, it must be said that the risk of feeding animals with contaminated materials represents a relevant economic loss. Just think to the deosinivalinol effect of pig growth or the relevant sexual implications, the analysis of raw materials and eventually unfinished feed is a support of animal health and business profitability. Food and feed producers can manage the analysis themselves or demand the analysis to service laboratories who go for the analysis of samples provided by their customers and follow their, particular, their peculiar requests. Despite who is performing the analysis and which method is elected to perform the verifications, the analytical uh, workflow includes two other important steps that are, for certain aspects, even more important than the analysis itself in determining the overall analytical reliability. Sampling plays a crucial part in the precision and determination of mycotoxins levels due to the sometimes very heterogeneous distribution of the toxin in agricultural commodities and products for human and animal consumption. And if not conducted optimally, can be the major source of error of the entire process of analysis. The following phase of the process is the sample preparation in which procedures are grinding and homogenization are performed to prepare the sample for proper testing step. Finally, during the analysis, the obtained prepared sample is the subject of specific analytical protocols, which allow to extract any toxins that may be present, their quantification, and eventually characterization. From the truck to the lab, how can we obtain a representative sample and an adequate test portion for the analysis? Most of the mycotoxins, and especially aflatoxins and fumarnicin, have an unheaven distribution in the batch. This could be a truck indeed, like in the picture, but could be also a ship, a silo, a trench, a bag, with bulk or packet material. To make sure that analysis leads to a reliable result, a number of incremental samples must be collected, either through a static collection or through a dynamic sampling for instance, during the material download or transfer. To go for a static or dynamic approach depends on the final analytical need. The point is to collect several incremental samples of adequate size in random conditions, put them together in one aggregate sample that must be fully homogenized before taking the small laboratory test portion. Just to give you some more concrete information, the European Commission have laid down the official procedures for sampling foodstuff for mycotoxins analysis for enforcement purposes. It is clearly specified 
how many incremental samples have to be collected from the batch mass, depending on the lot weight and the size of each incremental sample. The bigger is the mass, the higher is the number of samples that must be collected. Since the laboratory analysis is subsequently performed on a small aliquot of the bulk sample, it is necessary that the sample be representative of the bulk contamination. The heterogeneity of the distribution requires that the entire analytical chain from the collection of incremental samples to the formation of the bulk sample and the preparation of the test aliquot is characterized by maximum representativeness. Therefore, for the formation of the test portion, it is necessary to resort to a rigorous homogenization of the aggregate sample that can be performed by either grinding or mixing with water to obtain a slurry. The effectiveness of homogenization per grinding is closely related to the sample particle size, and this was demonstrated several times, both for aflatoxins and fumonisins as well as for the osinevalinol analysis. A wholesome analysis could be run in a hurry, like during the goods acceptance, skipping an adequate grinding and homogenization procedure could lead to false compliance, false positive inaccurate results. Furthermore, it has been shown that the aliquot size plays an important role as well. Analyzing 2 grams or 10 grams or 50 grams of a sample is not the same. The higher is the sample portion, the higher is the analytical overall reliability. For mycotoxins analysis, there are a lot of techniques and methods that range from a chromatographic approaches to the new technologies for on-site testing. For hindrances needing easy, rapid, simple and sometimes high analytical volume through capacity. Immune-based assays are the technologies of choice. Rapid methods based on immunochemical techniques often have the advantage of not requiring any cleanup or analyte enrichment steps. ELISAs have become routinely used tools for rapid monitoring of most mycotoxins, especially for the screening of raw materials. The advantages of the mycotether plate formats are speed, easy of operation, sensitivity, and high sample throughput, which contributes to make ELISA tests commercially available for most of the major mycotoxins. Other examples of immunochemical assays besides ELISA involve deep sticks, flow through membranes, and LFDs. Dipstick has a similar principle of operation to that of ELISA, and flow through membrane based immunosays provide qualitative and semi quantitative determination of mycotoxins on one step strip tests within a few minutes. In particular, here is reported a schematic representation for a lateral flow device for mycotoxins research on the left while a typical principle of direct competitive ELISA is shown on the right. Essentially, lateral flow devices, also named immunostrips or immune dipsticks, are fast in situ screening tools for immune chromatographic tests that work in a competitive way, having a labelate antibodies as a signal reagent and working as pregnancy tests. The results from these tests are positive or negative, and came from visual evaluation. Portable photometric strip readers can also be used for obtaining results. Although this method has great advantages, a major reason for limiting the use of lateral flow is related with the interferences they cause. Their limited application is linked sometimes with reproducibility, reliability, with different matrices, and sensitivity. ELISA are plate-based assays. Being mycotoxins small target molecules, the competitive layout is required so that the result that is measured is inversely proportional to the mycotoxin concentration in one sample. In one session, it is typically required to run a standard curve made of calibrators with known concentrations and sample extracts. 
the microtizer plate based format ensures the capacity of the LISA assays to handle in a few minutes dozens of samples in parallel, as once the reaction is stopped, the plate is read at once in a dedicated photometer. Eurofins Technologies has declined the ELISA technology for mycotoxins analysis into four different lines. The point here is to provide industries with some values, such as different product size tailored for different analytical throughputs, 24, 48, 96, and 192 determinations, cost efficiency for number of analysis, how much our same protocol are simple and shared the same sample preparation, the absence of a simple preparation in case of milk analysis, and validated protocols for automation solution. Thank you very much, Evelina, for this introduction and overview. Thank you a lot. So, Eurofence Technologies is providing four lines of kits. I believe that in the market there are a lot of solutions for mycotoxins analysis. And although we just learned that the analytical reliability depends just in a small portion for, uh, from the analytical tool itself, because it's much more relevant how I do the sampling, how I do the grinding, how big is the sample portion that I manage. It is in the end also true that evaluating and validating a kit for mycotoxin or a method for mycotoxin is something very important and sometimes also pretty tricky for industries. Because we, we see here there are a lot of features to be considered when evaluating a potential supplier on the potential product, starting from the performance. Here we have a list. So we have specificity, selectivity, sensitivity. These are concepts closely related to the concept of false positive and false negative ratio of the method. This concept express how specifically the system detects the analyte we are interested to with no interference from metrics or some you know, irrelevant congeners or molecules that we don't want to measure. And how little concentration the method is able to determine as positive to distinguish consistently from blanks. So specificity on one hand and sensitivity on the other. Precision. The precision also is very important is the degree of agreement among individual test results uh, that are repeated. And it is a mandatory requirement for any analytical method, even more important than accuracy. Uh, that is, uh, how can I say, how close my result is to the true value. Uh, we can imagine that we have a system that is, I don't know, systematically overestimating the concentration of a toxin. Well, that could be somehow managed, uh, if we know, and predicted. But a random behavior, uh, you know, leading to scattered, unpredictable results, but that is hard to be handled. So precision, robustness are really important aspects to uh, be uh, validated and verified when, when selecting and searching for an analytical tool for mycotoxins. Then there are other parameters that have to be prioritized somehow uh, before starting any practical evaluation. So each company, each laboratory, each quality team could rate these parameters under different logics, meaning that there is not the ideal um, method somewhere in the world available. Um, the quality, I believe, must be sustainable, must be uh, put in a routine. Each laboratory, each environment knows what, what counts for them. So ease of use, cost, Throughput flexibility could represent the most relevant aspects for some, I don't know, small environments, small laboratories. On the contrary, huge companies that clearly do not have the same issue of, of costs, for instance, and have systematic high throughput, uh, a high number of uh, samples that must be handled, maybe 
in this situation, they could pay more attention to other aspects, uh, the, the, the um, logistics, uh, the technical assistance, the worldwide presence of the supplier. So, uh, you know, uh, there are uh, different aspects to be rated. And uh, once more, there is not a unique product that fits all the needs around the world. It is important to, to, to have this in mind. But going into technique that we are here to talk about, let us start with an exercise. So we have to define, we have three kits for aflatoxin that are commercially available. These are real solutions. And we have to define among these, which is the best ELISA product for aflatoxin analysis. And we have here three extracts of the instructions, of the manuals. So what can we do? What can we tell with this information? Basically, it could seem that kit A is uh, actually the most sensitive comparing the measuring range. But do we have really to pay attention and investigate a little more? There is an, in kit A a discrepancy in the LOD, the limit of detection, and the first calibrator concentration. And this is because the concentration uh, of the calibrators here do not take into account the sample dilution factor. So it is true that in the kit A, the antibody is able to detect the 0.05 nanogram of AFLA per milliliter in solution, but the limit of detection in matrix is 10 times higher. And furthermore, the limit of quantification for mice is reportedly 2 ppb. And this is a relevant information indeed, rather than where the curve lays. Let us then compare the pattern of cross-reactivity. The B kit, that seems to be the worst in terms of sensitivity, minding just to the measuring range, is capable to consistently detect all the four regulated aflatoxins with cross-reactivity higher than 75% and turns to be, unexpectedly, the first choice when it comes to time to analyze the total aflatoxins. On the contrary, the C kit shows very little interference from aflatoxin B2, G1, and G2, and turns to be a better tool for aflatoxin B1 specific analysis. Why do we need both solutions? In the European Union, both levels are regulated. There is one limit for total aflatoxin and one, usually 50%, for aflatoxin B1. China has limit only for aflatoxin B1. FDA has issued a limit for total aflatoxin. So it is important to define where we want to go and which aflatoxin we really want to measure. Also for the kit C, we see that the calibrator's concentration already consider the dilution factor. And um, the LOD and LOQ are the same at 1 ppb. So which is the best kit? Probably in the end, not the kit A. And for any reason, it is more cost efficient. Uh, it is not, I mean, cost efficient or, or, or faster. B, the technical point of view, is sensitive enough to meet the European regulations for total aflatoxins. And C is perfect indeed for B1 specific analysis. So when it comes to time to evaluate several commercially available offers, take your time to collect the technical documents, ask the suppliers the information you need on applied calculations, specifications, ask for the validation data, and make then an adequate comparison. So let us have now a deep dive on validation. Is there one single validation approach on, for mycotoxin screenings? Well, definitely not. For the following discussion, I've decided to compare one international guideline to the scopes and approaches of two famous certification bodies, uh, aiming to highlight common points and differences. So the first one 
that is very famous and widely adopted by mycotoxins kit producers is the FGIS from United States Department of Agriculture. Specific, very clear and well-described protocols are public on their website and define exactly what to measure, how to measure and the acceptance criteria for each measurement. A kit producer that aims to get the FGIS approval must submit a report with data following their precise indications and must pass the inspection. For each toxin, FGIS has one or two mandatory metrics to be submitted that are actually the only metrics uh, that then will be verified practically by FGIS body, by, by their people, so independently. Then there is a list of additional metrics that can be fatherly cert certified, but this implies that the applicant submits a report and there is no independent verification. It's good to keep in mind when you evaluate kits. A customer that uses uh, an FGIS approved method knows that strictly following the approved procedure for certified metrics only, the performances are supposed to be completed to their own criteria. Totally differently. The European Union released in 2014 the first guideline for the validation of screening method for mycotoxins, focusing on the most simple analytical goal, that is the capacity of screening to discriminate samples that are below and above a certain threshold, that here is called the screening target concentration. This is not a fixed value. It is a target concentration defined by the end user who is committed then to uh, define if the selected method is able to respond adequately uh, by analyzing a variety, a variety of different independent samples. And last, there is a third approach. The AUSC Research Institute deserves to be mentioned as they also provide third parties approvals to analytical methods. Here, the validation protocol developed by AUSC reflects specifically the claims of the applicant. So it is not strictly standard as the one of the FGIS, but usually includes the characterization and discussion of several aspects, uh, typically the calibration assessment, selectivity, sensitivity, specificity, accuracy, precision, consistency, rugedness. Most of the experiments here will be in the hands of the applicant and there will be a sort of confirmation demanded to an external independent entity that is not the OEC uh, group itself. So. Let us put some order and analyze a little more in detail the FGIS approach. For each mycotoxin, FGIS lists a very precise protocol with the following chapters. You see how to green the materials, how to store sample, how to prepare the reference materials and standard solutions for the certification, which are the analytical conditions, how to arrange the kit instructions how to handle different procedures for sample preparation. And look, every option, every preparation must get a dedicated package of data. There is no room for alternatives or unspecified steps. So you can grind or you can mix. No, you have one procedure that is certified. If you want to have an alternative, you have to certify independently this alternative. And then, uh, which is the maximum tolerate assay time, including the sample preparation, that is always 30 minutes in total, including the reanalysis of out of range diluted samples, and also how many figures to display. And then, how to determine the accuracy, how to discard and dispose of these are those materials, how to characterize the sensitivity of the reading system to electromagnetic fields, how to demonstrate the sensitivity of the assay to temperature, how to determine the shelf life, and then 
as is clearly described, how FGIS is going to confirm the performances once the report is received from the applicant. So, very clear, very precise. Some few comments. The FGIS certification applies per matrix coupled with a specific protocol, a kit and a reader. And this applies both to Lodge of Flow and also to ELISA methods if they are fast enough. Second comment already mentioned, for each toxin, FGIS identifies one mandatory or two mandatory matrices to be validated both by the applicant and independently by FGIS. And then there are a list of optional commodities that can be certified without being revised by FGIS, only submitting the report. These are important aspects to consider when evaluating one FGIS approved kit versus one that it is not. So, the accuracy is the core aspect of this kind of certification. There is a well-defined list of concentration that is given for each mycotoxin we see here, AFLA and DON. The applicant is required to collect the reference materials at these very given levels with minimum tolerance for the assigned concentration. No spiking experiments are permitted, neither the shift from these given values to others, because you would like to, to have some, some other concentration certified? No. It means that for the, the four reference samples must be gathered and run in a number of replicates, and of those, 95% must be compliant to the given specifications in terms of precisions and accuracy. Are the displayed ranges fit for your knees? Too wide, too tight? So, taking uh, the aflatoxins protocol just as an example, the applicant is supposed to collect 21 replicates for each level, so 21 determination for each of the four samples by involving three different operators and three kit lots under blind conditions. Each operator must run the seven measurements and one over 21 determinations could be out of the permitted range of accuracy. And this must be repeated for each of the matrices and each of the protocols submitted. And this is also going to be repeated by FGIS technicians when they, once they get the adequate training from the applicant for the mandatory matrices only. This way, the precision and the trueness of the product are measured jointly to the lot-to-lot -lot consistency because you have to use three uh, cat lots. So the overall expense for this validation for such kind of exercise is to have four samples and three kits lots. It is possible to apply for extended measuring range as well, actually, or with lower limit of the uh, with lower limit of the detection and higher upper limit. Even if this is actually, I would say, not a common practice among kit producers. From a customer perspective, the FGIS certification does not highlight something. Metrics effect, sensitivity of the assay, that could be eventually below the prescribed concentration of FGIS. And similarly, these aspects could be missed in, uh, if, if a customer decides to follow FGIS criteria for their own internal validation protocol. On the contrary, a totally opposite approach, the European Union brings back the screening concept to the bare capacity of a method to discriminate samples at a certain desired level. The screening target concentration is then the level decided by the laboratory, by the company, and the fit-for-purpose screening method should classify with 95% confidence the samples as negative or below this concentration or suspect above uh, the screening target concentration. The aim 
the goal of the validation is to demonstrate the fitness of purpose for the screening method. This is done by determining the cutoff value and the false negative and false positive or false suspect rate. For this scope, a minimum of 20 homogeneous negative control samples and 20 positive control at the screening target concentration are needed to be tested under intermediate reproducibility conditions. And the cutoff is then determined using the mean response of positive samples plus a certain number of standard deviations. The European Union is emphasizing um, the use of different materials, not to repeat 20 times 20 measurement of one blank samples. Different and dependent materials are expected to have a higher genuine variability, and the standard deviation is expected to be realistically scattered compared to the variability of one single sample that I run several in several replicates, also in different days, I mean. And the graph, you can see an example of the distribution of the response of uh, positive control. Uh, the mean value as uh, the orange line, the calculated cutoff in blue, and how the blank materials are for real below the cutoff. What if uh, the method that we select has already been validated through a collaborative trial, so with interlaboratory results? Then the user can downsize its effort and reduce the experiments just to confirm the fitness for purpose, for purpose by means of six materials only. Never, never it is permitted to reduce this quantity or use one single sample. Also, for the quality monitoring, it is recommended to keep two positive control samples in routing and to recalculate the cutoff once per year. So, we have seen two different approaches, very different, minding different things. The European Union does not deal with the accuracy. The FGIS approach does not deal with the sensitivity or the metrics effect, which is the approach of the AUSC. We said at the beginning that the certification path through AUSC is pretty customized, but usually it includes some milestones like um, the calibration study, uh, selectivity discussion, matrix study, the lot-to-lot -lot consistency and stability, the robustness st study, and it includes a portion of data that are submitted by the applicant and an independent validation study. Most of the experiments of um, the matrix study are addressed to the applicant who must demonstrate um, the reliability, the repeatability, the accuracy, the sensitivity, the specificity of the method. While um, dedicated work package is addressed to the independent laboratory engaged for this project. So as a general protocol is not available, you cannot find on the internet, we will follow an extraction um, of the validation outline and results collected by European Technologies for the approval of ice cream AFLA M1 milk for its application to milk analysis. So this is a kit that detects aflatoxin M1 in raw milk and milk powder. So to perform the matrix validation on milk, following the four part preparation protocols uh, included and in the instructions, we went for four separate validations. This recalls uh, um, somehow the FGIS approach. We involved two operators and used two readers for running mill samples that were spiked at five different levels given by AOSC and that were analyzed in five replicates each under blind analysis condition. We didn't uh, use reference materials. Why? Because 
all the control and reference materials available are powdered. So uh, for liquid real milk, as it is in routine, we were asked by IUC to go for spiking experiments. But it is possible that in other conditions, the validation outlined is adjust and adequate to the availability of reference materials in the market. This approach studies the repeatability and the accuracy, but does not enhance the matrix variability until it remains in the laboratory of the applicant because we have used one single sample. But data were confirmed by the independent laboratory. Uh, for this specific project, uh, we were assigned to the QLA laboratory in the US that we never met before, and we shared nothing but the kids. And they were asked to, to sample their local fresh milk. So on the blue uh, table, you see results obtained with Italian fresh milk, let's say. And in the orange, the repetition, the confirmation of performances done with you, American fresh milk. Then in the AUSC approach, there is the need to confer, to, to, to validate the specificity and sensitivity. Um, we assess the LOD, the limit of detection and limit of quantification LOQ with these given formulas. Uh, LOD calculated as mean response of blank material of one blank material plus three standard deviation and LOQ estimated as the mean response of blank plus 10 standard deviation. We went also for the confirmation, confirmation of this estimated LOQ by spiking milk at a close concentration because we wanted really to see, not in real samples because they were spiked, but at least for something similar to the real samples, if we were for real available, able, capable to determine this small concentration. So again, we run, run four protocols as they are included in the kit insert. The results were equal, one series to the other, with LOD around 3 to 3.5 ppt and the LOQ around 5 ppt. So we confirmed with spiking and all results were detected consistently as positive and also pretty accurately. And again, uh, we uh, had the confirmation of uh, the um, evaluation done in Italy by the independent laboratory. We used just two of the four available protocols and obtained almost the same LOD and well, even better, but let's say safely <laughs> we kept the LOD at three and uh, uh, almost the same LOQ. The point here, we use one single material. So it's an approach different from the European Union where multiple uh, independent um, samples must be used, but we had this independent confirmation on something totally different. So what? We saw three different approaches. One is focusing on the accuracy and the precision at given fixed concentration. One is focusing on the false positive, false negative ratio and the definition of a fit for purpose cutoff that is more flexible and defend and, and uh, yeah, and, and, and does not relate to the accuracy, the recovery. And then we have the AUSC approach that aims to defend specific claims, where a mixture of the two approaches is used. We have to talk about accuracy, precision, and there is also portion related to the characterization of selectivity, specificity, and sensitivity, but with a different um, experimental approach to the European Union. Is it important not to rely on, on, on several samples or is that um, just fine to use one and spike at different levels? 
Is that acceptable and realistic to go for spiking experiments or is that recommended for routine approach? I mean, to use reference materials only, maybe that are naturally incurred. So in Europe and Stecna, we have been doing research on mycotoxin screening kits since late 19th, and we have our internal approach that combines what we do believe is the best to have a clear vision on the kit's performances on metrics. So for each kit, we do a calibration study to define an adequate linear accurate range. We then determine the selectivity of the antibody, both without and with the metrics. So we study the cross reactivities. We run some accelerate and real time stability study to assess the shelf life of the product. We verify the robustness of the kit to temperature, simulating you know, traveling conditions, and then the rigidness of the assay to some small reasonable, obviously realistic protocol modifications that could happen during manual implementation, like, I don't know, a temperature deviation, a mistaken pipette volume, or a modification in the incubation time. And finally, there is obviously the metric study. We do like a lot and follow the European guideline and try to gather as many blank materials as we can, ideally 20 as recommended because we believe that this gives a realistic picture of how challenging and variable is a matrix. You know, having a specific CT assessment on one sample under repeatability or intermediate reproducibility would pose a risk to us. To have two conservative standard deviation and a non-realistic cutoff value that then does not apply to routine of our customers. Then typically we use the same blank materials for some spiking experiments to determine the limit of quantification. We inherited actually this approach from the past European guideline for the validation screening of drug residues in food of animal origins uh, that preceded for years uh, the one of, uh, for mycotoxins. We first verified the rate of false compliant results and the capacity of the system uh, to consistently quantify the analyte at the result level. And if available, we like to confirm the LOQ on really naturally contaminated materials. We believe that the accuracy and precision should be defined by means of naturally incurred certified reference materials at different concentrations, ideally four, as you know, it is recommended most of the cases by FGIS, so that we are able to cover the whole dynamic range. Such kind of samples are unfortunately not always available and obviously can be substituted with someone else, like naturally contaminated samples whose certification have been given, uh, not the certification, the concentration has been given with a chromatographic method, so not an immunoassay. And spiking experiments are left as the last option in case naturally mater natural materials with, you know, natural content of metabolites are not available for any reason. So th thank you, Julia, for this overview on the validation approaches and this final take home message with a good practical recommendation for our audience. Now it is time to move to the final part of this talk with Francesca discussing about how to transfer a method on automation and what to check. So Francesca, the stage is yours. Thank you, Evelina. What to check is the right point. One automatic analyzer substitutes the manual implementation, so basically it does not affect the extraction efficiency at all. Also, it should not affect the binding reaction between the toxin and the antibody, so the performance of the assay should not be under discussion. On the other hand, a plate analyzer is not a human being and acts differently, so it should be verified the K 
capacity of the instrument to obtain compensations with comparable or better result than those obtained manually. The pipetting step could be arranged differently from an expert and well-equipped laboratory technician, so it is important to verify the absence of any drift, any delay in one strip or in the play due to the pipetting time. In some machines, such events can be, can be handled. In some other, a reduction of determination but must be accepted. Also for machines using non-disposable tips, it is very important to verify that there are no cross-contamination events with the mycotoxins being carried over from a sample to the following one. And apart from the initial verification, my recommendation is to run a regular maintenance and cleaning plan and use some control materials to periodically check the machine performance over the time. To make the process clear, I will present as a case study the application of ice cream AFLA M1 milk on Eurofan Technologies one plate analyzer bolt. The first task included the definition of a working protocol for the bolt to pipette and wash as prescribed in the kit manual. Basically, all these steps are copied from the kit booklet. Here, my change was to define an adequate washing program at the end of each incubation. As you can see, after the first incubation with the sample, I had to use one volume of washing buffer. And then after the incubation with the enzyme conjugate, I use a different volume of washing buffer. The protocol was performing very well. Here in Neurofins Technologies, we compared a few manual sessions to those collected by two independent machines and got not only compliant results in terms of signal, intensity, curve positioning, and pipetting precision, but more in general, a very compact group of sessions with overlaid calibration curves. Also, standard in this very kit are made of milk. Running the curve is not sufficient. The bolt operates with one single pin for all the pipetting step. On one end, this saves a lot of disposable plastic tips. On the other end, it may pose a risk over performance variability if the pin is not properly washed after every step. I went for a cross-contamination investigation, loading first a highly contaminated material with concentration close to the upper concentration level of the cube, followed by a mil blank milk and then some samples with intermediate contamination. If the pin was not adequately cleaned, I would have noticed some carryover, some over-contamination in the well following the high contaminated sample. As this not happened repeated time, I was confident not to have any carryover issue. Some automatic analyzer has intrinsic limitation in the number of determination that can be run as the machine is slow and implicates some operational delays. I wanted to run a wall plate 96 wells running alternate reference materials to see if the SA result had an impact on the sample position. As visible in the graph, all results were compact despite the solution, the sample position. So I was confident not to have any drift effect. I went then for some accuracy and precision verification. 
boson spike materials and reference materials. Fresh milk was used as a wall with natural content of fat and defected, as both are allowed procedure in the kit insert. Most important, I work with an external laboratory to stress the machine with routine sample. With a robot, maybe a new machine, a one-shot verification could lead to false results that could deviate in routine. As the real matrix remains stick to the robot component and tubes get dirty. We analyzed around 600 samples in parallel with the robot and manually, getting a, a very high correlation in terms of accuracy and no drift related to the robot aging. Now that a certain time has passed, I want to reinforce the recommendation of using control of reference material in routine to intercept any deviation from a expectations. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca, for your contribution. And we are approaching the end of our time. Thank you to uh, the audience for the attention. Evelina, do we have time for any uh, final question or comment? Yeah, actually, we are very, very close to the end of our time, but we have time for at least one question, I think. Uh, the first one is regarding of uh, the technique, the ELISA technique. So if ELISA is such a simple technique, why should the automation be suggested as solution? Thank you, Evelina, for the question. Um, if the technician has to run a high number of samples, a robot can reduce the pressure of operators that have not to do the repetitive dispensation as manual procedure. Additionally, the robot is able to run uh, ELISA with standardized condition and the performance are better than manual analysis. The mistake and mismatch are reduced um because the software has a simple end user interface the last but not least advantage of robot is the possibility to run multiplex analysis the technician can program an analytical session with method for searching different analytes and share the same sample the automation offers 100% of flexibility and the analytical needs of the customer are easily set up. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Francesca. So we are very close to uh, running out of time, actually. So I would like to thank you, uh, all the people who join us to spend this hour together. Of course, we are available for further questions next days and feel free to contact us. Have a nice rest of the day. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.